Thank you, Jeffrey Chair. Members of the Board of Directors of Solo University. Um, Tantri, Dr. Subramaniam. Uh, members of the Board of the, of the Jeffrey Chia Foundation. In 2016, when I was in Oxford as the very first Jeffrey Chia Scholar in Residence at Brasenose College, Tantri Jeffrey Chia, our chairman, visited the UK and Brasenose, of which he's an honorary fellow. He was probably coming to check up to make sure my nose was to the grindstone uh, because it's very easy to get distracted in Oxford. But as well as Oxford, the visit included a trip to Cambridge. And there, the Regis Professor of Physic, in our parlance, Professor of Medicine, Patrick Maxwell, showed him a very large hole in the ground. It was a building site named Capella and it was situated in a prime location beside the world famous Laboratory of Medical Biology, from which 14 Nobel Prizes have been uh, awarded. And the Li Ka Shing uh, Cancer Research UK building right beside it. The brand new Royal Papworth Hospital and the 1 billion AstraZeneca headquarters, all in, the, in this vicinity right beside this site. And it was on the Edinburgh site, which is now known as the Cambridge Biomedical Campus. In less than three years, the hole in the ground became the six story Geoffrey Tier Biomedical Center with a complement of some 600 scientists and support staff in four major research institutes the Cambridge Institute of Immunology and Infectious Disease, CIT, IID, the Wellcome MRC Cambridge Stem Cell Institute, the Milner Therapeutics Institute, and the MS Society Cambridge Center for Myelin Repair. The JCBC, as we call it, has state-of-the-art facilities, including level two containment laboratory, which allows for research to be carried out on the deadliest pathogens and has led the way in tackling the SARS COVID pandemic. It is a key part of our major collaboration between Cambridge and Sunway, which was signed in 2017. And Ken Smith is our lead in the JCBC. As well as being head of Department of Medicine in the Cambridge Clinical School, Professor Ken is director of the Cambridge Institute of Therapeutic Immunology and Infectious Disease. He has a large research group and has major collaborations with institutions around the world, including NUS Duke Medical School in Singapore. Ken studied medicine at the University of Melbourne and completed a Bachelor of Medical Science at the Nuffield Department of Surgery in Oxford. He trained in nephrology at the Royal Melbourne Hospital and did a PhD on beta cell immunology under the direction of Sir Gustav Nossel, FRS, and David Tarlington at the renowned Walter and Eliza Hall Institute. As well as his position as Professor of Medicine in Cambridge, he is Ku Un Tech Professor of Nephrology at the National University of Singapore and is a Fellow of the Academy of Medical Sciences. Ken will give us a lecture, the Jeffrey Chia Distinguished Speaker Series lecture, in which he describes the, resp the response of the JCBC to the pandemic. Please welcome Professor Ken Smith. Charles, uh, thank you very much. And, and thank you to everybody that's made my visit uh, over the last couple of days so pleasant. Uh, if I could just have my first slide, please, so I can stop that building going up. Uh, so maybe I should push a button. Oh, there we go. So I can get rid of this. I need to need the next one. Uh, yeah, sorry. Uh, I'm a Mac person. So. Uh, uh -huh. Thank you. 
Brilliant. So, uh, <clears throat> so I, I'm also grateful to the, the ambassador from Japan for warming up the audience here. Um, what I'd like to do is to tell you the story of the beginning of, of, of the Jeffrey Chia Biomedical Center with a particular focus on immunity and infection and with a focus on, on how we responded to the SARS-CoV-2 pandemic. Um, so the idea behind the Institute started some years ago in 2013-14, when it became clear that Cambridge, despite having considerable strength in immunity and infection, had that strength quite spread out across a campus, uh, which minimized the synergy that could occur between different groups. So we decided that if we were going to focus on the immunological and infectious problems of the future, we needed to get everybody under one roof so that we could uh, work together more effectively across disciplines. We therefore thought about an institute that could address what I think will be the big problems that we're going to face or are facing now, but we'll face over 40 to, or more years. Pandemics was high on our list, antimicrobial resistance was high on our list, as was the impact on infection and immunity of, of changes in the climate and environment. We were building that on a strong base where we already had many groups working on immune mediated and infectious disease. And we wanted to do this in the context of a global network. So we designed a, bu a building uh, and dug a hole in the ground and at that point, uh, rather miraculously, uh, Jeffrey Cheer turned up and made the whole thing happen. And you've seen pictures of it happening earlier. I put up Limmy Wong's uh, photo here because Limmy was important in putting together the original bid. She's a graduate of Sunway College who went off and did medicine in Ireland, topped her year and then uh, did a PhD in my lab just as the building was going up. So, um, so this is, is the Jeffrey Chia Biomedical Center uh, now. And if I go to the next slide, I'm sure I've told you all that. Uh, well, actually, yes, to make one more additional point, the, the Inf Institute of Infection and Immunity, CITID, we call it, uh, extend, has its heart in the, in the Jeffrey Chia Biomedical Center, about 27 or 30 research groups, but has two or three embedded in the MRC Laboratory of Molecular Biology to give us reach into the uh, structural biology strengths of Cambridge and a substantial footprint in the clinical part of Vaddenbrook's Hospital to allow us to work in, on human biology directly. So this is how the, uh, the building is currently arranged. Let's see if I can get this pointer to work. Yep. So the top half effectively uh, is the is sitted uh, and it contains what is the largest uh, high security BSL-3 facility in academic hands in the United Kingdom, some of which is shown there, which is a terrific facility. Uh, and a big flow cytometry and immunophenotyping facility downstairs. And as Jarlath mentioned, we share the building with the Wellcome Trust MRC uh, Stem Cell Institute, which is Europe's leading stem cell institute. And in fact, technically and scientifically, we have an enormous overlap and synergy with that group. Uh, and the Milner Institute, which is focused very much on translation. And again, that's been a terrific ally. So th this building works as a quite uh, sort of seamless entity at times. Uh, and I mentioned that we have outposts in the hospital uh, and clinical research facility and in the LMB. So most people think of Cambridge uh, as this sort of sleepy, pretty sort of place, which you can hang out as, an, as, a, as a tourist, but that's actually not where the science is happening in Cambridge. Uh, that's where you go on weekends if you're lucky. Uh, this is the Cambridge Biomedical Campus. And this is the biggest biomedical campus in Europe. This is what it looked like in 1972. So it's grown from almost nothing uh, very quickly. Uh, and the Jeffrey Chia Biomedical Center is here. So it's very central. Uh, it's next to the Lee Kashin Cancer Center here and slightly taller than it. Uh, it's, there's a big hospital here, Adam Brooks Hospital, which is about uh, 1,100 beds, a maternity hospital uh, where all of our children get born, uh, a big clinical research facility. Um, but as Jarlath mentioned, it's also next to the new Papworth Hospital, the largest cardiothoracic hospital in Europe. The Heart Lung Research Institute, which is also part of my department, which uh, had its official opening about two weeks ago, and AstraZeneca's global headquarters, and GSK's only uh, uh, clinical research facility in, uh, in the world. Uh, they do their first in man studies here, uh, and this is the laboratory of molecular biology. So it's in a quite remarkable site for, for high quality science. And beyond the campus uh, is the rest of, of, of Cambridge, which is not only the academic side, but uh, it's worth remembering that there's an enormous strength of biotech 
and over 600 companies locally on different science parks and on the campus itself. And so this is the biggest biotech hub in Europe as well. So there's a lot of options for integration with industry, but also neighboring institutes, which I won't enumerate, as well as of course the NHS, which is a, a great strength. So, um, so I think I've mentioned all of that. I should just mention, mention one more thing that, that the sort of translation that can happen on a campus where you can take fundamental science through to the clinic uh, is exemplified by the discovery of monoclonal antibodies at the LMB, uh, which now make up six of the world's top 10 drugs. So you can make really quite profound, but long-term contributions in this sort of context. Uh, so, uh, so when we, we, the building went up, um, we were all very excited. We moved in in October and November 2019 and started to get organized. Uh, and then in very early January, news came from China of a, of a new viral illness spreading from Wuhan. Uh, the first UK cases occurred on the 30th of January, 2020. And we started working on this virus actually in late January, early February. Uh, a number of the virological groups took an immediate interest in this. Um, and then over later in February, the university started to shut down all of its research facilities. And in fact, it shut down every research facility. Uh, and the, one, the only one that stayed at fully open uh, was the Jeffrey Chia Biomedical Center and the, and the Immunity Infection Institute. So we, we justified doing that by shifting the, the, the focus of every group in the Institute onto COVID-19 and also bringing in three or four other groups from across the university that were particularly uh, important in the research effort and giving them a temporary home. Uh, and so you can see that by April, the cases were starting to rise in the UK, and we were already pretty well up and running with most of our research effort, as I'll show you, by the time the cases really started to ramp up. Uh, and, and this is the sort of structure we put together over those first few weeks, and I won't go through this in detail, but this is the sort of complexity of the organisation we had to put together to get samples from very sick patients in a very stressed hospital system, and we did that um, by bending a few rules. Uh, fortunately, most of the administrators went home and didn't enforce those rules. The ones that stayed were extremely helpful uh, in helping us get going quickly. Um, but also using not just the staff within the JCBC, but all of the scientists were sent home, of course, across the rest of the campus, had nothing to do and were stuck in lockdown. So we had enormous numbers of volunteers who came to help us with, with many aspects of this research. Um, so, and uh, this is the eventual sample pipeline, which I don't think matters except to say that it, it was put together very quickly. We realized that if we were going to start doing research at a point when the NHS was spectacularly stressed, you know, with uh, people coming in hypoxic, with the, the intensive care unit quadrupling in size, then filling up, um, we needed to do the sort of research that actually benefited the NHS uh, before it benefited, benefited researchers. There was no way there was capacity to help with an academic exercise. So we focused our initial program on things that we knew would help. Uh, so we, we set up the first SARS-CoV-2 screening of healthcare workers in the country, which I'll describe. We introduced the first point of care testing for COVID-19, developing a new test with Helen Lee, um, modifying a, a, a technique or technology she was using in Africa for point of care HIV testing. So we had that going in two weeks to help patient flow through the hospital. We demonstrated the efficacy of aerosol reduction using filters. I won't, won't talk about most of this, but I'll talk about the first and the last of these four things that we, we did to deliver patient benefit. Because alongside that, of course, we were recruiting patients into studies, collecting samples and putting together the baseline that we needed for, for longer term, uh, more in-depth scientific research. So we, we realized that there was, no, not only was there no capacity for staff testing, there was barely the capacity to test patients for COVID-19. The assays weren't fully available. They were laborious, manual PCR-based assays. And uh, it, once a patient came to the hospital, they'd go into a sort of waiting room ward that, where they could be waiting more than 24 hours to get a test result to work out whether they should go into the green bit of the hospital that was COVID negative or the red bit that was COVID positive. And none of the staff were being screened. So we, we set up these temporary pods, uh, which, uh, which are pictured here with Mike Weeks, who helped set up the clinical side of this. Uh, and we developed in the JCBC a PCR-based high-throughput assay for, 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 for SARS-CoV-2 screening, very robust, based on experience that some of our people, Ian Goodfellow and particularly Stephen Baker, had had with setting up Ebola assays in the field. Uh, and the benefit of these assays was they used different ones that the NHS was competing with the rest of the world to get. So we could do this at scale and quickly. We said in our volunteers that I mentioned earlier came in and ran this overnight. 
So we had this running 24 hours a day and we could swab staff members as they came off the ward in the evenings and have their result before they started work the next morning. Uh, the hospital was terribly nervous about this because it wasn't clear whether we'd find a half, the patient, half the staff were positive, we'd have to send them home and the whole hospital would collapse. What we in fact found was that about 3% were positive and we could send them home and the hospital didn't collapse. But of the patient, of, sorry, of the staff members who were self-isolating with symptoms, 80% were negative and they could come back to work. So there was a net benefit in terms of staffing levels. But you can see these are the, the this is the percent of the positive tests we got at the start of the program across the different wards. The Amber Ward is where you waited until you got your test results. So there's quite a few positive staff members there, but most of the rest were out here in the red wards, the COVID wards, uh, only one major outbreak in the, in the non-COVID wards. And I'll come back to that later. Uh, and this, by sending these patients home, or these staff members home, it, it, you can see that the positivity among staff members fell dramatically. And essentially we, we almost wiped out uh, infection among staff members. And what we essentially found was that the measures we were taking to prevent patient to staff contact were in fact incredibly effective. And much of this transmission was between staff members. So once we stopped it, uh, things improved. Um, and the reason that was important is if you look here, uh, this is the lockdown started here, cases started to come down, but by the time we were getting our screening results back, more than half of the cases in Cambridge were generated from the hospital, uh, not from the rest of the community. So we'd become the, the major COVID distribution center, which sort of defeats the purpose a bit. And so staff screening then reduced that into hospital transmission almost completely. So it was important, and that, that had a direct impact on, on government policy. Um, we also diverted the, all of the samples from these, the staff screening for, for sequencing. And I'll come back to that in a second, but that allowed us to under, well, so a bit more about it now, that allowed us to understand the relationship between the viruses at a genetic level, because they will mutate and have sort of unique signatures. And we found, for example, that the group on ward A, that green ward on the left, uh, all of the staff had an identical virus indicating they weren't getting this from patients, they were getting this from each other, and it was a staff room issue and we got them a better staff room and made them wear masks and sent people home and that went away. Um, and similarly, we found clusters in other wards where we could explain transmission. Um, at the same time as doing this, uh, Ewan Harrison and Sharon Peacock began to initiate uh, sequencing of SARS-CoV-2 virus on a, on, a, on a major scale. So the sequencing we first did in the JCBC, uh, both Ewan and Sharon are members of the Department of Medicine, very quickly that was scaled up at, at the Sanger Institute, uh, neighboring Sanger Institute, and it ended up forming COG UK, the uh, UK wide consortium. And they, they set this up essentially in one month from first talking about it to having it funded, to having significant numbers of sequences coming through. And all, all of these sequences were generated in. in in our, in our labs uh, before the real scale up. I won't go through the details of that. Um, but they ended up with a nationwide comprehensive uh, program involving all of these different agencies, a sort of nightmare of co coordination, which I wasn't involved in directly. I sat on some committees, but a huge amount of work. Um, and essentially what that enabled is to do for, from the population were being screened. Uh, they, most of the tests were going to these large lighthouse laboratories, one of which we established in Cambridge, there were uh, four of them, I think. Uh, they were then feeding all of their samples to the Sanger in big containers. So what was the point of that? Well, the point of that was it, it told us a lot about how this pandemic work. So when the pand pandemic started in the UK, it was thought that most of the cases were coming in from China uh, and from Austria, where there were some famous ski parties that all got infected and came across the UK. Turns out that, that they weren't the major source of virus. Most of the virus came from Italy, which is where the first European outbreak was, and then from France and then from Spain. So it came from our neighbours, where there's a lot more passage of, uh, of, of uh, people. So the viral transmission was, was local rather than distant international. Um, but nonetheless, you could use this data by comparing sequences in different countries to the sequences in the UK to work out the effect of travel restrictions and comparing countries where we did and didn't have travel restrictions. And you can see the reduction caused by travel restrictions is, um, is you know, significant. That's a sort of six-fold reduction. What makes a difference on a national level to a pandemic once it started is a quite different question, and I suspect it doesn't. Um, but it might make a difference very early uh, so, 
so it ena enabled us to make nationwide uh, decisions like that, but it also made, allowed us to look in detail at individual outbreaks across the country. So this is the yellow bar that I showed you earlier on from, from Addenbrooke's. So we've, we've basically uh, could, at a quite granular level within individual workplaces or, or hospitals, uh, integrate into epidemiological data with the sequence data to understand outbreaks. So for example, we, we had six or seven patients who had identical viral sequences, but they were scattered across the region around Cambridge, it made no sense. But we worked out that they're all dialysis patients. And not only were they all dialysis patients, they're all treated on the same shift, these guys here. Uh, and they were transmitting the virus to each other in the minibus that picked them up to take them to dialysis. Uh, and by working that out, we could stop that transmission route, which is particularly, I'm a nephrologist by training, so particularly important uh, given the dialysis patients don't do well with COVID. Um, we also extended our screening program into the university. Uh, ben Warren and Dinesh did most of, of this along with, uh, with uh, Nick Matheson. Uh, so all of the colleges, each staircase in each college, uh, pooled samples once a week and we sequenced them and then obviously deconvoluted if what the pool was positive we'd go into everybody in the in, the, in that uh, grouping and that really shut down transmission in the university very effectively um, it also not only did it shut down transmission but what transmission there was it enabled us to understand that uh, confirming some very ancient theories about how the university interacts with cambridge city so what we found was that the students who uh, students are read the students who got infected all had a single clade of viruses, uh, almost nothing in common with the rest of Cambridge. So we, the, the town and gown remained very separate. Uh, these were all spread, um, maybe it's on the next slide. Yeah, so, um, so they were all a single genetic cluster spread from a single nightclub, which I won't name, largely from a single college, largely starting with first year students. So all of what you might predict. Uh, uh, but, uh, but knowing that, of course, enabled us to be much more effective at preventing repeats of that and controlling it. So, um, so this was the first university to comprehensively screen its, its student population as a result. And then on a national level, once the new strains started to emerge, this sequencing program really came into its own. And, and what you really need to do is get Ewan Harrison or Sharon Peacock here to, to tell you this in more detail, because it's quite a, an exciting story. But you can see here for the, uh, the first of the B lineage variants, uh, there was nothing going on in September you can start to see just around London some first arrivals in October. By November, it's embedded in London up to sort of 80, 70 or 80 percent, but still not in the rest of the country. And then things sped up 14th of December. It's, it's got this sort of coverage uh, just two weeks later, uh, this and then the whole country is taken over in about two months. So a remarkable sort of detail that the sequencing done at such a, a global level provides of, of variant movement. Um, at the same time, when we set this up, we did a study with Sunway, which uh, Steve Baker led on with, with Ian Goodfellow, uh, just to demonstrate that we could get entirely compatible sequencing results between the two countries. And, and, and that sort of knowledge of comparability between our different platforms was vital to, to a lot of the data I've just shown you, the international aspects of it. So, um, so as well as setting up those things early on in the pandemic, we also set up some longer term, more complicated studies about the impact of the immune response on recovery to COVID-19. What was, became very clear when the disease started was that uh, most people, and this is from a very old review from early in 2020, uh, the, uh, that most people had a viral response phase to infection, which resolved the infection and they were fine, but a subset went on to get an inflammatory disease that that caused mortality and, and long-term damage. And the big question was, what's going on in there? What turns these people into these people? What's initiating that inflammatory response uh, in, a, in a minority of people? And can we do anything about it? So uh, one of the things we did was to start collecting samples very early in the pandemic uh, and collecting them sequentially in a range of patients. So we had, um, we, we recruited patients with this spread of severity. So our, our asymptomatic healthcare workers that I've just mentioned, uh, our symptomatic healthcare workers who were at home but being screened, and then people admitted to hospital who didn't need oxygen, did need oxygen, or needed assisted ventilation on intensive care. So we had this, the full range or the gamut of, of uh, severities. As you predict, uh, there were more males in the, um, in the severe group. Uh, this is, of course, there are many more females in these groups, not because of COVID-19, but because they're healthcare workers. So this is 
got nothing much to do with COVID, but, but this has been well described in the, the, with increasing severity, you get more males and you get patients who are older. Um, so that's not surprising. But what we could then do is measure a lot of different variables over time in these groups. So these are the severity groups again, from asymptomatic through to ventilator. Uh, and this is time windows after the onset of first symptoms. Um, and you can see these various inflammatory markers, the details don't matter unless you happen to know what they are. Um, but the severe group, uh, none in, this, in these mild groups, and it's there very, very early. We can detect it within a day or two of, of symptom onset. Uh, systemic inflammation in the severe groups that isn't in the in these groups um, and we can also see profound changes to the immune cell subsets and again there's too much detail here I think from the back of the room you can see the point the point is that uh, blue is down and these are different white cell subtypes in your blood this is uh, we did about 70 this is a subset of them but the first thing to notice is again in the severe but not the mild groups there's a profound reduction in most white cell subsets and we know from other experiments, a lot of this is due to hypoxia, uh, although not necessarily, not all of it. Uh, a couple of cells go up, uh, sort of nasty activated T cells go up and plasma cells that make antibodies go up, but everything else goes down pretty well. So we can again get a very detailed picture over time with severity of what's going on in the immune response. And that allowed us to draw some, I think, reasonably interesting conclusions. So in patients who were asymptomatic and had mild disease, actually they're plasma cell response was quicker by many days than the response in more severe patients. Their antibody response seemed to be faster. They had an earlier impact on activating their T cells, which fight viruses, and they had no evidence of, of, inf of systemic inflammation using those various markers I showed you before. Um, in contrast, the people who went on to get moderate to severe disease who were admitted to hospital had systemic inflammation clearly present at symptom onset. So there's nothing you can do about that unless you can detect them before symptom onset. They've already got systemic inflammation. Um, and their T and B cell response, even though it was amp amplified late, was delayed in getting going, which again could, could uh, impact on control of virus. So this sort of detailed immune analysis, which is ongoing, as I'll, I'll mention in a minute, uh, is something that very early sampling and then repeated sampling uh, helped us achieve. But we only did that because we were seen as useful to the clinical service as we approached the patient because we were doing all the other things I've just mentioned. Uh, and as I said, this was a, an enormous uh, effort that involved really very important in, input from the NIHR Bioresource and John Bradley uh, and a huge team of, these are the guys in my lab who did, and other labs who did most of the work and a huge team of volunteers who made the whole machine happen. Uh, the fact that we then had a huge database of serum samples and cells uh, from, from patients from the very beginning of the pandemic allowed a lot of follow-up studies to happen. I'm gonna to touch on a few that Ravi Gupta then did where he put together de uh, data that he generated in, uh, in the seal laboratories in the Jeffrey Chia Biomedical Center in the, the, high, the high microbiology called security uh, labs, largely involving viral culture with the serum samples and antibody samples from the various patients and subjects I mentioned to understand uh, how vaccines were coping with the virus, for example, and how different subgroups cope with the virus. Uh, and so he, I think he published five nature papers in a year as a result of, of being able to answer these questions quickly uh, because of the infrastructure that had been put together. Um, so this just shows the virus, which is meant to spin around, but it doesn't, oh, it does there. You I don't know what the point of that is, but uh, it looks pretty. Um, and, uh, and the question really is what's going on with these new, so this is the original Wuhan strain, these are the, the other different strains coming up and you can see them the Omicron one being particularly different. And, and so he studied the immune reactivity of those strains. Uh, essentially working initially with, uh, with Derek Smith in pathology who's an expert on antigenic shift in influenza and has been for many years uh, and found similar antigenic shift occurring in SARS-CoV-2, that is uh, the technical details that I won't bore you with, but, but very big changes in, in genotype of the virus resulting in, in new strains. And this is not news to anybody. Um, the question is, where did these come from? So one of the early things that we noticed and, and uh, Ravi and, and James Theventhren and others were part of this was that immunosuppressed patients couldn't clear virus. Uh, and even if some of them were quite well, so some of them would die of the virus, but some of them were reasonably well, but, but in both groups, they, the virus was persistent. So the question was, was persistent virus 
the situation in which mutations could be accumulated and impact on pathogenicity. And of course, Ravi was attuned to this because Ravi works on HIV and that's exactly what HIV does. It persists and causes trouble. So, so this was a patient um, that uh, was studied and that's the viral teeter shown there. Um, oh, hang on. So there's meant, meant to be other data coming up here. So this is a, a glitch going from Mac to PC. Um, so I'm going to describe this data. It doesn't exist. So essentially, uh, this was uh, the persistent virus was of, of a certain strain. And as soon as co convalescent serum was introduced here to treat, so this is the injection of the patient didn't have their own antibodies. They've been treated with B-cell depleting treat therapy. So they introduced antibodies at this point, uh, convalescent plasma. So antibodies derived from patients who'd recovered from SARS-CoV-2. And that immediately drove a complete shift in the variants that were growing in that patient. They shifted to a strain that could no longer be neutralized by the antibodies. So the antibodies essentially selected from the range of viruses in that patient, the strain that the antibodies couldn't see. Uh, when, the, uh, when these convalescent serum wore off, the other strains came back. When the convalescent serum was reused, the other strains went away because they were neutralized and back came the strain that was resistant to the antibody antibodies. So I think this was demonstration that within a single patient, there's selection pressure on the virus that can create viral breakthrough uh, against the immune response. Uh, and of course, this is a concern because of course, there's lots of people in the world with HIV and with other immunosuppressive conditions who will get persistent SARS-CoV-2 and will be generating these sorts of variants all the time. So I'm sorry about the lack of data. Um, and I think this is what I've just said, uh, that, uh, so I won't, I'll let you read that as I flick on to the next thing. Um, Ravi then went on to, to try and understand the differences between the immune response to the different variants. Uh, and so, for example, this is the, the mutations that differentiate Omicron versus Delta. I'll come back to some of the specifics about this later, but at the moment they don't matter, but there's lots of differences between these two strains, enormous differences. Um, and he then was able to very quickly assess vaccine responsiveness in the laboratory to this new strain that we'd recognized coming to the UK. It hadn't really spread beyond London, but we, already, we knew it was there. We could get the virus, we could get into the lab with these samples and do the tests. And essentially what you can see is that uh, this is the um, virus neutralization of the Delta variant to vaccinated serum. Uh, and this is the Omicron variant. And you can see um, a, this is a log scale. So this is a significant reduction in responsiveness to vaccination at antibody level to this new strain. So we immediately knew within days of knowing that the strain was on the way that our vaccines wouldn't not be as effective as at preventing infection. Um, he studied, for example, the immune compromised patients and found that even after uh, three doses of vaccine, 25% of patients were still not protected. In the, this is a broadly defined immune compromised group, but once you gave a fourth boost, they improved. So again, this could then inform policy and we have a different vaccine strategy for immunocompromised people to, to compare to the rest. Um, and it allowed us to start to see differences in, in variant behavior. And I'll, I'll come back to this in a second, but the Omicron variant, for example, uh, can't induce cell to cell fusion. So here's cell to cell fusion, all the cells joined together and going green uh, from, the, from the Wuhan strain. Uh, and that doesn't happen uh, as enumerated here with the Omicron variant, which is likely to have important implications for how the virus behaves and how it causes disease. So I'd like to tell you one more semi-in-depth story about COVID. Um, and this is work not published, done by Nick Matheson's group um, and Penn Wen, his postdoc. I don't know why he's wearing his cycle helmet for this picture. Uh, or why it's twist-tisted on its side, actually. But, uh, so what Nick, Nick is a virologist and a clinician who is interested in, uh, in the details of neutralization, not the sort of crude assays I've just shown you. I shouldn't say that if Ravi's not here, so that's okay. Uh, looking at, at, at overall neutralization to serum, but very specifically at what antibodies to which bit different bits of the virus impact. And what he noticed was that antibodies directed, so this is the spike protein, which is the major protein that the virus uses to enter cells. This is the receptor binding domain that binds to ACE2, which is the, the, the bridge it uses to get into the cells. And this is the internal domain, which doesn't bind to anything that we know of. And so he compared antibodies, neutralization of antibodies binding to this bit to neutralization of antibodies binding to this bit uh, and got very different curves. So why? Why are these antibodies that bind to different bits of the same protein giving me a different behavior of the virus in culture? 
Uh, and he modified a plaque assay to uh, and establish this. This is now used in a lot of different laboratories around the world. It's a terrific assay, but essentially infected cells go green. So you don't have to do cultures and spend two days measuring the virus. They just go green and you can measure them immediately. Because the virus spreads in two ways. It spreads uh, from cell to cell. So each little viral infection then just spreads to its neighbors, shown here. Um, but it also spreads uh, more globally, if you like. So, um, so it's, it, it spreads cell free. So one will just spread to five spots, but it also then said spreads directly to its neighbors. So this first spreading is through, through, this, through, the, um, through liquid. The second spreading is at cell contact. Uh, and so this assay allows you to differentiate those two. So that you know, if, you, if you stop uh, spreading of cell free virus, you get fewer spots. Uh, if you stop cell to cell spreading, you get the same number of spots, but they're smaller, if that makes sense. Um, and when he looked at the two antibodies, he found that uh, the receptor, the N terminal domain antibodies specifically stopped cell to cell spread. And the receptor binding domain antibodies largely just stopped cell free spread. So these two different antibodies stop different sorts of viral spread. And I think, and if you put them together, uh, they were more effective. So the receptor binding domain is blocking cell free spread. So there are fewer spots, but they're big. The N terminal domain antibodies don't stop cell free, cell free spread. So there are just as many spots, but they stop cell to cell spread. So they're very small. Use both, you don't, you clear the virus, at least in vitro. Um, and that's very likely to be important uh, because there's a number of studies, and I'm not going to go through these because they're not our studies and they're technically difficult, but there's increasing evidence that that cell to cell spread is actually very important in driving pathology and driving inflammation. So what we have to do is forget, and some early vaccines actually only, only express the receptor binding domain. So that isn't the whole story. We've got to develop strategies that uh, are more widespread than that. So, so Nick's conclusions were that, uh, that SARS-CoV-2 spreads in these two distinct ways that I've mentioned, uh, and that the viruses, uh, the antibodies target them differentially. So we have to design both our therapeutic strategies and our vaccine strategies to make sure we're, we're generating antibodies that do both of these things and not just one. So I think that's sort of important. Um, and what I'm not going to talk about is long COVID. Uh, and because I'm going to run out of time. And I'm looking down to see if Jarlath's twitching. Is he twitching? He's not twitching yet. Um, but nonetheless. So, um, but I am talking about long COVID tomorrow. But uh, so long COVID, I hate the term long COVID. Because long COVID is clearly more than one disease. It's used to essentially refer to if you have acute disease that is either very mild or moderate or severe, uh, the outcomes range from complete resolution through to persistent symptoms to critical illness or death. Uh, and so lo lo long COVID is a sort of bucket term to refer to any persisting symptoms. But, um, but we know that there are of course many diseases hidden within that that have different causes and need different therapies. So anyone who's been on a ventilator in intensive care for a couple of weeks has ongoing inflammation and persistent symptoms once they go home. Much of the long COVID symptoms that are reported are, are that. They're what you see in any critically ill patient as they recover is, is persistent symptoms. Um, a lot of patients have ongoing cough and lung infections. That's because they've had a lot of lung damage. That's what you see after any cause of severe lung infection. So that's not specific and it's very different to the intensive care and it's very different to uh, the other forms of uh, long COVID. There are neurological sequelae, which David Menon uh, in Cambridge, but others have shown has actually reasonably specific MRI uh, findings if you do very detailed, not standard, but very detailed MRI. Um, and that's another subgroup. And then of course you have people who often had mild disease who have what looks like a post-viral fatigue syndrome of the sort that we've seen in many years from many viruses. So that's just a subset. You immediately think of four different sorts of long COVID that have different causes and therefore different solutions. That's why I don't like the term. I think it clouds the issue rather than illuminates it. Um, but uh, we, we are able to explore what predisposes to that because we've been collecting samples in our patients now out to a year. Uh, and so I'm going to talk about that tomorrow at the Sunway Medical Centre in a bit more detail rather, rather than here. But, but, uh, but essentially our finding is, is that in our relatively small cohort, we see persistent symptoms primarily in those who've had very severe disease and primarily who've had major impacts on, on their erythropoiesis actually is the best predictor 
So how many reticulocytes you make to try and recover from the hypoxic and inflammatory insult of this seems to be the major correlate of, of long COVID in that severe subgroup. Um, but um, and the other thing that, that we're leading and that's going very well uh, are studies, in, uh, interventional studies aimed at preventing long COVID. So one of the things that um, I think the UK did well, did some things were quite badly, and you can ask me about that later, but one of the things it did well was to set up some very global, rather crude clinical studies. Um, and they were crude because they had very limited clinical information that came out the end but they were effective because you could therefore in a complex and stressful stress situation, roll them out quickly across the country, get large numbers and, and get answers. And that was the recovery study that, that demonstrated that, for example, the steroids were effective. Um, and so using the same principles, uh, Mark Toshner and Charlotte Summers in the department have set up the HEAL COVID study, which is a national study already recruited a couple of thousand people uh, using different interventions to try and prevent long COVID. Uh, so that's the name of the study, that's Charlotte and Mark. Um, and at the moment, they're, they're just finishing a, a, a Pixaban, a, a factor 10A blocker, so an anti-clotting agent, and a torvastatin. Uh, but they've, they're already starting, and I'm not allowed to tell you, unfortunately, what they are, but two more agents. And so each of these, this is just a rolling program, treating thousands of patients with one of these after another, using a quite interesting adaptive trial design uh, to, to try and find out... Uh, what works, but with very crude primary and secondary endpoints to allow this to roll across the whole NHS. Uh, um, so at the same time as doing this, we were doing other things. I know that the guys weren't meant to, they were meant to be working on COVID-19, but they were finishing and working on other things that they were doing. I just flagged this up to, meant to, to remind everyone that we're not a COVID institute, but Paul Lane had published this lovely paper on HUSH which he discovered, which is the mechanism the body uses to silence mobile elements. So this sounds rather technical because Paul likes that sort of thing, but essentially our genomes are constantly under attack from viruses inserting bits of DNA into them. And this is the mechanism that we silence that DNA so it doesn't wreck our genome. So it's critically important. It got Paul his fellowship of the Royal Society, may get him more than that in the future. Uh, Arthur Kayser, uh, a gastroenterologist, uh, in searching the cause of inflammatory bowel disease, uh, found a mutation in this thing called famine and described a whole new biochemical pathway that exists in mammals that was previously only thought to exist in bacteria. Uh, so that's quite cool and has a lot of implications. Uh, and my own group, we've been working on MS and other autoimmune diseases. So there's lots of other things going on, which, which today is not about. But what this first uh, couple of years of the of Citadel and Jeffrey Chia Biomedical Center has done is really we hadn't predicted it, but it's stress tested our institute. It's demonstrated it works on pandemics. Uh, it's actually brought us together working on the same subject in a way we never would have done before. Uh, so in, in some ways, it's been very good as a, as a way of molding an institute. I, I wouldn't recommend it as a routine, but, but there, were, there was a silver lining to the cloud. And we're now going back and focusing uh, more on, on the next stage, as well as going forward with things like long COVID and other um, so one of the major foci in the Institute, uh, and I'm not going to talk about it in, this, in detail because I think you should invite Stephen Baker to do it because he drives this program. Um, Stephen uh, has been working on antimicrobial resistance in Southeast Asia for years. He worked for 11 or 12 years at, uh, in Ho Chi Minh City. We've just recruited him from there. Um, and so he, this is his area of interest in, in antimicrobial resistance, uh, both in a clinical setting, but also of course an agricultural setting where a lot of antimicrobial resistant organisms arise. So uh, I would recommend uh, Steve talking to you more about that, but that's a really exciting aspect of the work that we're doing. Um, this is just some of his data, show, and I'll just show you the bottom one, but this is the rise of antimicrobial resistant infections compared to non-antimicrobial resistant. And you just look over the last few years, uh, they now dominate many, many pathogenic organisms are largely microbial resistant. And this is getting worse at a rate faster than actually than, uh, than even people like Steve predicted. So this is a, one of the next big things which we have to work on. And Steve's doing a lot of things, including making monoclonals as last ditch treatments to monoclonal antibodies that bind bacteria if all of the antibiotics have failed. Uh, really going back to diphtheria and antitoxin in a strange way where, where we all started this uh, 100 years ago. What my own group started to work on is the impact of temperature on the immune system. Uh, and we were struck by the fact that it's very clear that heat waves cause increased mortality. That's been known for many years. Even mild increases, you can measure this even in Norway. If, it, if they have a hot summer, you get a slight increase in mortality. But you measure it best in places like India, 
uh, where there are profound heat waves uh, that cause big, big increases in mortality. Uh, and the, the likelihood of those being associated with increased mortality is shown here. Uh, the striking thing about this is that it's increasing. It's been around for a long time, but it's increasing. Uh, we know that it has an impact on mortality, but we don't know what else it does. I mean, it may have an impact on health well beyond mortality. And in fact, it's extremely likely that it's not going to be just restricted to mortality. Uh, we know that both the average temperature and the heat wave intensity drives that and duration. And we know that the people most at risk are the elderly and the very young because they have most issues with, temp with core temperature. Well, we assume that it's because they have most issues with adapting their to core temperature in the face of, of challenge from external increases in heat. Uh, and we also, of course, know that the poor are at risk because they don't have air conditioners and have or have to go out and work during heat waves uh, in, and can't adapt. So if you read the literature, it says, oh, cardiovascular disease is the cause of this increased mortality. But actually, if you look at the data carefully, it's only about a quarter of patients die of cardiovascular disease. So what's going on with the rest? Uh, and more broadly, what effect does increasing temperature have on human physiology and disease? Uh, and so we want to make that a major focus of the Institute going forward. So just some very early studies we've done, and, and these are our, our preliminary data, but from mice, so mice, uh, mice live at 22 degrees in the lab, they prefer to live at, 30, at 29 or 30 degrees, but we put them at 22 because that's what our technicians like and that's what we've always done. Um, but if we put them up to 36 for a week and give them flu, we see that they make far fewer anti-influenza antibodies. This is the percentage of uh, flu specific uh, T cells, sorry, they're not antibodies, T cells. Um, and in fact, their overall T cell count drops about fourfold. So this is a profound reduction in antigen specific cells in response to flu just because they've been at 36 for a week. Uh, and this is their fold change in germinal center cells. These are the cells that drive the B cell response that eventually makes antibodies. Uh, and you can see that that's completely hammered by being at 36 for a week. So we're just starting this journey. We don't know how much this, how if we kept the mice at 36 for a month, would they adapt? And would this not, we're doing all of those studies. But I think there's an enormous science waiting there um, to in us trying to really understand what, what temperature does. Uh, one of the things that is very clear is that a lot of this is driven by metabolism. So mice stop eating when they get hot, uh, and presumably they're doing that to stop, not stop creating heat. Uh, and that has a knock-on effect on the immune system. And in fact, the sort of metabolic cost of the immune system is what we think in an evolutionary sense constrains the immune, the immune response. And we can go on about bats actually, which are very interesting because they have quite different metabolic constraints because they have to fly, which I think is why they're viral, um, uh, uh, viral sources, but that's a different story. But I think understanding how temperature impacts metabolism and the knock-on effects of that on the immune system, inflammation and various other systems is going to be enormously informative. We can't do it with epidemiology because people are too variable out in the field. They, they have different ad adaptive strategies, but if we can find specific problems in the laboratory setting, we can then go and specifically look for them in people and have a much better chance of understanding what, what the temperature rises we're all going to see are going to do to us in the future. So, uh, so it's very clear. That heat stress, that heat stress impairs immune function and development, but we're not sure of exactly the extent of that yet. And we're sure of the intermediate relationship in metabolism. Um, and we need to understand that at a, at a molecular level. In part, that will help us understand the impact on humans. In part, it will inform public health measures and perhaps specific interventions. But it's also likely just to increase the awareness of the impact of this that might uh, provide support for climate action and, and mitigation of the problems that we're, we're going without doubt to suffer. <coughs> Pardon me. So, um, so that's where we are. We've had a, a, an exhilarating, rocky, and sometimes difficult first couple of years. But uh, the Jeffrey Cheer Bi Biomedical Centre opened at just the right time, really. And uh, I think particularly through the founding of COG UK and some of the other things I've talked about has had a profound impact on our response to the virus, but will also put us in a terrific position uh, when the next one comes along. And, uh, and I'm sure that others will talk about surveillance and the strategies for doing that in the future. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ken, for that uh, 
very wide ranging and informative uh, discussion on what's going on in the Geoffrey Chair Biomedical Centre in Cambridge. Just the top two floors. Yeah. No, yeah. <laughs> um, and you, you obviously realise we're in a very dynamic situation at the present time. We're still in the middle of this COVID uh, pandemic. You know, the uh, the end is not in sight yet. So, uh, the work of the centre is going to be continue to be extraordinarily important. And we hope that uh, in Cambridge we will. Uh, overcome the lead that Oxford got with its vaccine very quickly over Cambridge. So uh, uh, we're looking forward to the first Nobel Prize in the Geoffrey Chia Biomedical Center very shortly. Thank you. Uh, I'd now like to invite any questions and I'm sure there are quite a few. So, so Jarlath uh, told me not to mention Oxford and now he's gone and done it. Um, <laughs> but I should just point out, Jarlath, not only has Cambridge won more boat races than Oxford, but it has won about twice as many Nobel Prizes. So I'm, I'm not sure a small substandard vaccine makes much of a difference. Okay. <laughs> All right. <laughs> Questions? Who wants to ask the first question? That man there? Yeah. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Thank you very much, Professor Ken. My question is that looking at your presentation, as everybody knows, different vaccine has uh, different effects. So would it, wouldn't it be best to combine the traditional, the vector base and the mRNA in each of, each of the shots? But is it done? Like in UK, what is the, the, the preferred? So, so yeah, so it's an interesting point. And, um, so I've had three Pfizer vaccines and I, based on pr first principles of immunology, I'd rather have had different vaccines, uh, each taking a slightly different approach to give me a breadth of coverage. So I think that's a logical approach. I, I think there's some evidence that, that mixing vaccines does improve efficacy, but it's not actually solidly built into anyone's protocols yet, I think because the evidence is not yet strong enough. So I think that, um, but I think it's a good idea. I think that taking a, a mix and match approach at the moment could be effective. Um, so I think that, so that's one thing. I, I think the other thing, of course, that we have to think about is whether we end up with a situation like influenza where we watch these new strains come out and start to make new vaccines as we do with flu, a different one every couple of years as the need arises to increase our coverage of new strains. I, I've talked to, I'm not a virologist, but I've talked to my virological colleagues and we all have this idea in our mind that the virus is going to evolve, become more and more and more well-behaved. Uh, there's actually not a lot of evidence that that's necessarily going to happen. You know, new variants could arise that are, are, are more pathogenic than the ones we've been facing. So I think we have to remain very vigilant and we shouldn't assume this is now on a, you know, even though things have got much better with the vaccines and um, uh, we shouldn't assume this is going to go away. And we shouldn't also assume that when people say, oh, it will become endemic as if that's fine. Well, it's not fine. You know, TB is endemic. It's not, it's not a good thing to have. Malaria is endemic. It kills lots of people. So endemicity and chronicity don't, don't mean that we've found a solution. We have to remain vigilant. I suspect we'll end up coming up with new vaccines every year or two in the same way that flu does. Yep. Hello. Hi. Um, yeah, my question is, there are so many variants arising and the Omicron is making the Pfizer vaccine four times less effective. Um, do you see that future next generation vaccines may not comprise B cell epitopes, you know, may not? Oops, sir. Your microphone, yeah. Yeah, yep. there could be a, a move towards T cell based vaccines because some of the cancer patients, immunocompromised patients, aged patients, they may not have good hum humoral response. Yeah, so I think it's fair to say that you do get a good T-cell response to most of the vaccines and, and, and the antibody readout is just used as a simple shorthand for efficacy, but we certainly find patients who don't have an antibody response, and Mark Wills has done a lot of this work, who do have nonetheless a good T-cell response and vice versa. So I think what we should do is, is develop a much more nuanced approach to vaccine development. And as an immunologist, I've always been amazed at, I'm going to choose my words carefully here, uh, how empirical the vaccine development field has been. You know, it's basically get an antigen, mix it up with a whole lot of different adjuvants and see which one works better. Uh, and that's how it's always been done. And it's largely how it's still happening. And, I, and so your implication that we 
target much more intelligently uh, new vaccine strategies based on what we know of the immune system, I think is what's going to have to happen. Because it is, you know, unfortunate that immunity wanes and the immunity is so variable from these vaccines. And I'm sure that by tweaking that, we will be able to improve things. Uh, having said that, the other hope is that there's obviously an increasing emphasis or, and becoming more available antivirals that are also be proving more effective. So I think because they take longer to develop, we're going to continue to see new antivirals coming out that will be effective over coming months and years. And of course, monoclonals. So, I, so I, for sort of passive protection or early treatment. So I think we're going to end up with a much more mature and varied approach to disease. But I think primary, the primary thing will be a, a continued and more intelligent approach to vaccine design. Which, is, which I think is the implication of your question. Yes. Thank you very much, um, Adiba, Infectious Diseases. I have one clinical immunological question and one more public health. Mm -hmm. The clinical immunological, you sort of ran through the um, cytokine storm that actually killed patients before the advent of the vaccines. And it's very reminiscent of the dengue, um, so dengue shock that we see a lot of here. I think that work has kind of died down since the advent of the vaccine. Um, I'd like to hear from you what, what, what is the um, kind of latest thinking around the cytokine storm syndrome. And secondly, you know, I think we've all lived through the most horrendous two years. And um, what would your advice be to health ministers? We have a former one on the very minimum that a country like Malaysia, upper middle income, should set up to face the next pandemic because everyone's saying that this is not going to be the last one. Yeah, and it clearly isn't. We've had lots before and, and I'm sure um, uh, we, when the university was shut down, there was some discussion about this and, uh, and it was pointed out that the university has actually been evacuated many times before for pandemics. So I think the Black Death came through three times and each time the university was sent home, Isaac Newton observed the apple falling from the tree and made his thoughts about gravity, which didn't happen in Oxford. Uh, it, it, but it, it also, it, it didn't happen in, in Cambridge either. It happened at his home in Lincolnshire because he'd been sent home because of the bubonic plague. So, so this has been happening forever and we seem to have forgotten. You know, the, the influenza pandemic in 1918 was worse than this in terms of mortality internationally. And uh, we've forgotten it in two generations. So, so it will keep happening. So what should the former health minister do? Uh, <laughs> um, I, I think one of the things that has been clear is rapid, given the spread of the virus because of international air travel, rapid spread of information uh, about sequence and uh, rapid surveillance, not just to detect the infection, but to detect its spread is critical. And we put those things in place because we had a, a health system that was fairly homogenous um, but even then it, it was a struggle. And I think if we had natural line, uh, better baseline surveillance just ticking over, I think that would make things a lot better. Uh, and the other thing, of course, is a political will to, you know, there, there was, there's been obfuscation and cover-ups in all sorts of different countries in all sorts of different contexts that have hampered our, our global response to this. But if we could develop a more coordinated approach, I think that would be useful. One thing that was interesting is that scientists were quite coordinated. They communicated with each other, even though that caused them trouble in some contexts, uh, despite what government thought. And without that, we, it would have been worse. So I think transparency is important and surveillance networks are important. You can't do much about the capacity of your health system. I mean, uh, and none of us have enough spare capacity to deal with this. So that's got to be done on the, on the fly. But I, I think um, the other things can be addressed prospectively. And, and Ewan Harrison, who was involved in setting up COG UK, is now setting up a surveillance system sequence based uh, through a big grant from the Sanger Institute that will try and set up surveillance using single sequencing system for both new viruses, but also antimicrobial resistant organisms and a sort of single a global health focused uh, surveillance system. That sort of thing, I think, is what we need. And your first question was on the cytokine storm. You're quite right, and what I should have emphasized is that all the data I've shown you is from the very early patients. None of them were vaccinated, none of them had previous exposure, and we saw these very profound changes. What we haven't done, but other groups are doing, is continuing to repeating this sort of thing 
in patients who are vaccinated, where I think we'll see a quite different, well, well, I think we'll probably see the same pattern in people who do badly, it'll just be less common. Um, but I think we still don't know exactly what drives that initial inflammation in some patients, but not others, but we're, we're developing clues. So the genetics points to defects in interferon, type one interferon, which is one of the antiviral cytokines that's critical for controlling early virus infection. Uh, about 10% of patients, and we, out of the Jeffrey Chu Biomedical Center, we run the UK autoantibodies screening program, but the antibodies were first described uh, by, by Jean-Laurent Casanova, but about 10% of patients have autoantibodies that neutralize type one interferon, of 10% of patients on ventilators who do badly. Uh, and they, we think, just were out there in the community with these autoantibodies, not necessarily with any illness, but once they got COVID, they became very sick. And so I think, so that points to a failure of interferon early is one of the things that causes this. Um, but there's going to be lots of other things. So then the next question is, can you prevent it? Uh, I think that will always be difficult if it's already present at presentation. But early use of steroids and early use of antivirals are showing some efficacy. So I, I wouldn't be completely pessimistic. I hope that's not too vague. Okay. Any further questions? Hmm? See Brand, yes. So Ken, let me do the same thing as you did and, and ending with the uh, climate issue and uh, the effect on the immune system, uh, apparently. Uh, and you know, when, when you spoke about that, when we visited you in uh, Cambridge, I was very excited. And now you had another uh, step, I think, already, which is that it's going through metabolism. Do you have a little bit more detail on that? So I, I'm, because I'm a scientist, I'm always very cautious, which is why all the scientists have completely underestimated global warming, for example, because we, we don't like to overplay things. We've done two or three experiments and we need to do a lot more. But um, there has, there's been one other ex mouse experiment done by a Japanese group, uh, and they showed that by that actually, if you overcome the acute lack of eating that the mice have, you minimize the impact, don't, re don't remove it. Um, so we think in young mice, there's also an effect on growth of, of this increase in temperature. And that, of course, has potential implications for human growth. And that doesn't seem to recur, uh, re resolve when you put the mice back at normal temperatures. So I think we'll find in, if we do experiments on young mice, and I don't want to do these, but because uh, it's not what we do, but I think we'll find a lot of quite profound developmental changes might be caused by these, these um, temperature changes. That's speculation, but, but we see a hint of that in mice, which needs following up. Uh, and then in adult mice, I think we'll see changes that are less pronounced if we gradually increase the temperature. Uh, but I still think we'll see things that are there. I'm not sure how pronounced they'll be, but certainly acute heat stress. And of course, we see acute stress, heat stress in humans and 36 is not so hot um, by, by standards of a lot of places. Uh, we do see profound changes how, in whatever, from whatever angle we look. So I think we are going to, to have something very important to find out there. The challenge will then be to work out how that uh, impacts on humans and not mice. And so what we're currently trying to raise funds for is an immune challenge facility. So we can, we've, we've got plans for a 10 isolated rooms so we can infect volunteers with different infections. But I'd like to be, which is something that's starting to be done. It's certainly been done in things like malaria for many years and other infections you can treat. It's, but it's being done with flu and other viral infections as well. And if we could do that at the same time as putting people at 36, uh, we could do these experiments in people before we go out into communities to see what's happening out there. Because students will do a lot of things for money. And, uh, <laughs> and 36 is not so bad if you've got net Netflix. <laughs> so and, and if I can ask one more thing then, uh, metabolism, immune system, usually microbiome involved. Have you been looking yeah. at that? We have been collecting all the samples and have analyzed them for that. It, it must be involved. I mean, their diet's changing. Uh, the, um, so it will it will change. The question is how much it will be causally involved in what happens, and how much it will just be a an epiphenomenon. But everything we look at with the microbiome suggests it will be both. So um, so that I think that's going to be quite interesting as well. There's a limitless amount of work to do here. So um, fantastic. Thank yeah. you. Thanks. I wonder if I could ask a question, Ken. Um, we've had lockdowns. We've had. Um, closing of borders just 
internal in countries like Australia and between countries. Uh, we've had bankruptcies, we've had me enormous mental problems because of the actions of our politicians and our medical officers of health in various countries. Um, are we going to go through this all again with the next pandemic? Very hard for me to answer that, Charlotte. Uh, <laughs> I'd like to think we would have learned something from experience. Um, so firstly, I think it's pretty easy to criticize politicians and I particularly like doing it at the moment in Britain. Uh, it's, it's very easy. But having said that, I think, you know, most people were making decisions that were difficult. They were doing it with imperfect information, which was changing all the time. So I think it's pretty easy to look back in retrospect and point out uh, more problems than were really there. I think a lot of people were trying hard to get it right and some got it right, some got it wrong. Most people got it a bit of each because I think there was no perfect answer. So I, what I think, I, what I hope that we do is to get a better way of getting up-to-date scientific information to politicians in a way that enables them to make decisions more effectively than we have. Uh, and then we need politicians who can act on that. And um, and yeah, they're the challenges, but hopefully we can learn from experience. Okay, thank you. Well, thank you very much, Ken, for this very comprehensive uh, description of what's going on. We're very proud of what's going on in the Jeff Ritchie Biomedical Center and, uh, and congratulations on the fast response that there has been in the center to the, uh, to the COVID pandemic. So like, thank you very much. And now I'd like to ask, thanks, thanks Jolla. I'd like to ask Tantri Jeffrey if he would like to come up and uh, give you a small token of our appreciation. Thank you. Thank you. 